fly by the comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon. There's a monolith, a very unusual structure on this. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? The moon has been a subject of fascination and speculation for centuries, and with the advent of space exploration, numerous mysterious structures and conspiracy theories regarding NASA and the moon have emerged. The face on the moon, often attributed to a phenomenon called lunar pareidolia, is a fascinating example of how our brains are wired to recognize familiar patterns, like faces, in random visuals. Pareidolia, a type of apophenia, is essentially when we see meaningful connections in unrelated or random data. This specific lunar pareidolia first caught attention in 1976, when the Viking 1 orbiter captured images of the moon's surface. The most famous face appears in the Mare Imbrium, or the Sea of Showers, a large lunar plain. In these images, the interplay of shadows and hills strikingly resembles a human face with discernible eyes, a nose and a mouth. It is the pattern of dark basalt rock that creates the face of the man in the moon as we know it today. However, scientific explanations have consistently debunked any notions of these formations being anything other than natural. The face-like appearance is purely a result of how light and shadow play across the moon's uneven surface at certain angles. This illusion fades under different lighting conditions. Later missions, particularly the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, have provided high-resolution images clearly showing that these are just natural landforms like craters and valleys. This phenomenon has had a considerable impact on popular culture, sparking public imagination and featuring in various forms of media, often tied to themes of extraterrestrial life and ancient alien theories. NASA has played a significant role in demystifying this phenomenon, consistently explaining it as a natural feature and an optical illusion. They've used high-resolution images and scientific explanations to clarify the nature of these formations and taken this as an opportunity for educational outreach, teaching the public about lunar geology and the science of imaging and perception. Between 1969 and 1972, six missions blasted off to the moon. What a view, isn't it, John? Absolutely unreal. The theories about alien bases and UFO sightings on the moon, especially on its far side, have intrigued people for years. The far side's mystery, never visible from Earth due to tidal locking, makes it a hotbed for speculation. These ideas really took off during the space race and Cold War era, when space exploration was often mixed with elements of science fiction and UFO culture. Proponents of these theories often point to grainy images or videos, claiming they show structures or lights that hint at alien activity. Additionally, some base their beliefs on anecdotal reports from individuals who assert they have secret knowledge of space missions or extraterrestrial encounters. However, a closer look from a scientific viewpoint often reveals that these supposed sightings can be explained by more mundane causes. For instance, Camera anomalies like lens flares or image processing artifacts can create misleading images. Also, natural geological formations such as craters or lava tubes might be mistaken for artificial structures. This is similar to how people see faces or other shapes in random patterns on the moon, a phenomenon known as pareidolia. Both NASA and the broader scientific community have consistently found no evidence of extraterrestrial life or man-made structures on the moon. Their stance is backed by extensive data from various lunar missions conducted by countries all over the world. This transparency challenges the idea of a cover-up and shows that the moon's geography is purely natural. Popular culture, particularly science fiction, has significantly shaped how people view the possibility of extraterrestrial life on the moon. This influence is amplified by the internet and social media where unverified claims can quickly spread. As the 45th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission to the moon dawns, there are many mysteries about man's first lunar landing that remain unsolved. What did the astronauts actually encounter there? And what made NASA stop going back to the moon after Apollo 17? You know, there's been a lot of talk about NASA cover-ups and classified information, especially theories that cropped up around the Apollo missions. This was a time when the Cold War cast a shadow of distrust and secrecy 
and some people started believing that NASA had encountered signs of extraterrestrial life or ancient civilizations on the moon, but kept it all hush-hush. They point to things like altered photos, strange accounts from astronauts, and inconsistencies in mission transcripts. There's even a wild idea that ancient advanced civilizations left ruins or artifacts on the moon, and NASA's been sitting on this big secret. But when you look at it closely, these claims don't really hold up. NASA's always been pretty open with its scientific findings. They've shared a ton of data from lunar missions, and scientists all over the world, including those from countries not exactly friendly with the US, have had a chance to look it over. Plus, most of the so-called anomalies in photos can be explained by common issues like lens flares and shadows. And despite all the rumors, no astronaut from the Apollo missions has ever confirmed seeing anything out of this world up there. Then there's this spaceship moon theory. It's quite a story. The moon isn't a natural satellite, but an artificial one, like a giant spaceship or an observation station made by aliens. The theory points to the moon's size, orbit, and composition, saying it's all too perfect to be just a coincidence. They talk about the moon ringing like a bell when lunar modules landed, suggesting it might be hollow or metallic inside. But science has answers for these, too. The moon's size and orbit line up with what we know about planetary formation. These moon rocks are amazingly similar to Earth rocks, but they contain far less iron. This seemingly small difference offers a huge clue. The lunar rocks we've studied are just like what we'd expect from a natural celestial body, and they share similarities with Earth's mantle. This supports the idea that the moon was formed from debris after a massive collision, which is the giant impact hypothesis. And that ringing, it's not because the moon is hollow. The moon just transmits seismic waves differently than Earth because of its dry, rigid surface. Now moving on, have you heard about the water ice they found on the moon? It's quite a fascinating story. Back in the 1990s, spacecraft observations hinted at hydrogen at the lunar poles, sparking theories about water ice in the moon's permanently shadowed craters. But it wasn't until missions like NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and India's Chandrayaan-1 came into the picture in the 21st century that we got solid proof. Chandrayaan-1's Moon Mineralogy Mapper detected light reflections that were a dead giveaway for ice. Now this ice is tucked away in craters at the moon's poles, places where the sun just doesn't reach, allowing the ice to hang around. It's a mix of pure ice and some mixed with the lunar soil. This discovery is huge for lunar exploration. Imagine astronauts using this ice for drinking water, growing food, or even splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. It could open up a whole new world of deeper space missions. But of course, getting to this ice is no walk in the park. These regions are super cold, among the coldest in our solar system, so mining and processing this ice is a big challenge and a hot topic in space research. Switching gears, there's also this buzz about helium-3 on the moon. It's a rare isotope of helium here on Earth, but the moon has loads of it, all thanks to billions of years of solar wind bombarding its surface. What makes helium-3 super exciting is its potential for nuclear fusion reactors. It's a cleaner option that doesn't produce high-energy neutrons or much radioactive waste. People are already talking about how helium-3 could be the answer to our energy problems back on Earth. Its rarity and potential as an energy source make it quite valuable, economically speaking. But here's the catch. We're still figuring out how to mine and bring it back to Earth efficiently and how to use it in fusion reactors. Plus, there are concerns about the environmental and legal ramifications of moon mining. It's a complex issue, balancing the lure of a new energy resource with the responsibilities of space exploration and preservation. Did you know the history of lunar exploration is really fascinating? Way back in the 17th century, astronomers like Galileo were the first to peek at the moon's surface through telescopes. They noticed these craters and dark plains which they called Maria, Latin for seas. They initially thought these were actual bodies of water, but as we know now, those seas are anything but wet. They're actually vast, flat plains formed from ancient volcanic eruptions, less cratered than the highlands suggesting a younger geological age. You can look up in your own backyard and see impact craters on the lunar surface. There are over 300,000 craters, half a mile to over 500 miles in diameter on the lunar surface. Talking about craters, they're these circular depressions caused by meteorite and asteroid impacts. They come in all sizes, some spanning hundreds of kilometers. 
Most of them were formed about four billion years ago during what's known as the late heavy bombardment. Imagine the chaos back then, with the inner solar system getting pummeled by all these space rocks. These features, the craters and the maria, are super important for lunar studies. They tell us a lot about the moon's history and even the broader solar system's past. Scientists use them to date different parts of the lunar surface. But here's a twist. We used to think all major volcanic activity on the moon stopped about 3 billion years ago. However, recent data, including from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, suggests there might have been volcanic activity as recent as less than 100 million years ago. They've even found evidence of small shield volcanoes. This throws a whole new light on the moon's geological activity, showing it's way more complex than we thought. This is crucial for future lunar exploration. It affects everything from where to land spacecraft to where we might find resources like water and minerals. But of course, this research isn't straightforward. We're talking about events that happened millions of years ago, and piecing this puzzle together requires a lot of data from remote sensing and analysis of lunar samples. It's a constantly evolving field, uncovering new secrets about our nearest celestial neighbor. I saw this illumination that was moving with respect to the stars. We were smart enough to not say, uh, Houston, there's a light out there that's following us. So technically, it becomes an unidentified flying object. 